I just wanted to briefly point out to you that we have the agenda updated on the website here. So if you go to the agenda on the top of our page, you can now register for not only the current and upcoming event, but you can also click on future dialogues here where you'll find all the future dialogues with registration buttons next to them. So you can register for the future and then you won't have to think about it and you'll get your link in your email uh, right before the event and, and uh, in the lead up to the event. So thank you all for coming again to the second installation of Dialogues in European Jane Studies. I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Tine Wegemans at Ghent University, who's going to introduce the topic. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Um, also from my end, a warm welcome and gratitude to our speakers, our moderator, and all of you in the audience today. Um, the second session in our dialogue series deals with narratives, more specifically giant narrative literature. Um, in short, stories. Um, stories have played a prominent role in giant religious literature, um, from the Agamas all through the Sutras, Prabandha, and other types of literature. Um, although each text is produced in a given historical and geographical context, much of the material is sort of reused and circulated through commentary, through retelling, through oral circulation in sermons, but also around kitchen tables. Um, looking at the religious education of Jains today, especially for youngsters, stories are key and stories are reproduced from, in anything from animated movies to um, comic books, etc. It's not all um, pedagogy um, in the sense that often other considerations like aesthetics, devotion and debate come to the fore. And with that short foreshadowing of the theme of our two talks today, um, I will hand over to um, my colleague slash former colleague, Marie-Hélène Goris, now at uh, the University of Birmingham, who will introduce our moderator, Ter Eva, who will then introduce the theme of the specific presentations further. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Tina. Yes, I'm especially delighted today to be the one introducing Professor Eva de Clerc. Um, I would simply myself not be here uh, if it was not for her. Uh, and I know that many colleagues, who, uh, I know that many, many colleagues can say the same than me. So my deepest thanks to you, Eva, for all you have done and all you are doing for young researchers, always giving us a chance and always helping us wherever you see an opportunity to for meaningful research to be developed. Even if at times, like with myself and philosophy and epistemology, it might seem far from your specialty. So thank you for all this. And so Eva is um, a professor of South Asian studies uh, in the Department of Languages and Culture at Ghent University. And she is spe specialized in Jaina Ramayanas, uh, in Appa Bramsha literature, and in Digambara monastic history. Eva obtained her PhD in 2003 from Ghent University with a dissertation on Svayam Budheva's Pomacharyu as you can imagine, a Jaina version of the Ramayana in Apabrancha. So the first two volumes of her translation uh, have already appeared um, under the title Life of Padma in the Murti Classical Library of India uh, at Harvard University Press. And three more volumes are in the making, so stay tuned. A lot of stories. <laughs> so in addition to working on the Pomacharyu, Eva de Klerk also researches on uh, other Apabrancha texts on the Jaina literary culture more broadly. And she has, for example, published on karma and compassion and the position of animals in the Jaina universal history. And she's working on the history of the Jains, especially uh, the Gambara monastic history. So thanks to this expertise, she ensured that there was a strong teaching, not only in Sanskrit at Ghent University, but also in other South Asian languages relevant to Jaina studies. Uh, especially in Prakrit, Maharashtri, uh, in Apavramsha, in Brajbash, uh, and in Hindi. And this is embedded, I think we all know that this is embedded in a strong tradition of Jaina studies at Ghent University, notably uh, since the seminal work of Josef Dole, uh, um, who defended his own doctoral thesis in 1957. Uh, and continued by Frank van den Bos and people like this. And today, Eva de Kerk really stimulates further research by creating and by coordinating um, the whole South Asian network uh, in Ghent, Sang, a dynamic hub of Indological scholarship, 
with a particular focus on Jaina studies and on associated vernacular languages. I, I think we can say also that Eva also recently developed a full online master program focusing on Jainism and its languages. And today's session on nar Jain narrative will be the perfect illustration to all this hub of scholarship that Professor de Klerk's work facilitates, since all two um, speakers were PhD students of hers. So thank you, Eva, for agreeing on chairing this session on Jain narratives. And uh, I now let you introduce our two speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie-Hélène. Uh, yeah, I feel, uh, wow, thank you for these uh, lovely words. Um, and um, thank you also to, uh, to Tina and Chris for inviting me and giving me this opportunity um, to introduce um, Helene and, uh, and Simon. Um, Helene indeed being a, a, a former um, student uh, at Ghent University and a PhD student here. Um, Helene de Jong here is right now a lecturer um, of South Asian religions at uh, SOAS in London, um, whereas Simon uh, is uh, still working on his PhD at Ghent University. Um, well, to, uh, to I have a few notes about the topics or the papers that will be um, read today. Um, so the broader theme is that of Jane narrative literature. And within that theme, we you will hear two lectures that kind of, of you know, intersect with each other. Um, and they are, um, you could say they are part of, of one specific um, area within Jane narrative literature um, called the Jane Puranas. Basically, they, they deal with uh, how the Jains responded to the rise in the popularity of mainly of the Hindu epics and Puranas. Um, and I assume people in the audience know the stories of uh, Rama and Krishna and um, other, you know, heroes and gods, etc. Um, so basically, historically, um, in the first centuries of the common era, um, these, uh, these characters in kind of uh, what is now South Asia uh, grew in popularity. Um, and the Jain community also felt that they somehow could not, you know, they, they felt that they had to respond to that popularity. Um, they couldn't they couldn't really ignore it. Um, and they did this basically in two ways, two related ways actually. And in the two lectures, you will see to, yeah, two different ways of how of uh, of response to these texts, to these stories, to these characters. Um, and the first lecture by Simon deals with the Jain adaptation of um, of the Mahabharata. So I'm assuming that all of you know the Mahabharata story, or at least have heard the name Mahabharata and and know kind of the summary of the story. Um, so the Jains. Uh, integrated this story of the Pandavas and the Kauravas and their fight. They integrated that within um, something that has been termed by, especially by Western scholars, the Jain universal history. So when Jains talk of their Puranas, um, what they mean is a kind of um, legendary or mythological history of the universe, of the world and of the universe that is kind of goes on for ages and ages and ages. Um, within this universal history, we have the stories of the 24 Tirthankaras, right? But in addition to the Tirthankaras, there are other um, heroic characters. They are called Shalaka Purushas. Um, and it is within this Shalaka Purushas that the great heroes and gods of the Hindu tradition, or at least some of them, were integrated. Um, so basically these Hindu characters, or let's say non-Jain characters, they become Jain. They, they their 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 stories become absorbed within Jain stories. So also the characters of the Mahabharata, which is what um, Simon will talk about. Um, now it's important to realize that um, in the Jain Mahabharata, or at least in as far as it relates to the Jain universal history. It's not really the Pandavas that matter or the Pandavas and the Kauravas. It's really all about the character of Krishna. So Krishna is, um, is uh, within this, this Jain universal history, he is called a character uh, called the Vasudeva. So within 
I'm just gonna go back. You had the 24 Tirthankaras. In addition, you had a character called the Chakravartins, and there are 12 of those in each time period. There are what you if if you have the jinnas as or the tirthankaras as um you know the spiritual leaders of mankind then these 12 chakravartins could be called the kind of the political leaders of mankind they are um described as emperors who uh basically conquered the entire um yeah the the the, the entire civilized world and in addition to those two categories, there is there are three other categories, and they're basically triads. So you have three three characters all living at the same time. They are called a Vasudeva, a Baladeva, and a Prativasudeva. Now, if you know something about um, uh, Vaishnava theology and about the character of Krishna, then you will recognize the term Vasudeva is actually being another name for Krishna. So this category of uh, Vasudevas, in that category, you have the character of Krishna. And then the second category is that of the Baladeva. This is this character is always the older half-brother of the Vasudeva being um, Balarama. And then the Prativasudeva is their enemy who is killed by the Vasudeva. Now you might think if you know the story of Krishna that you know the Prativasudeva must be Kamsa. This is not the case in the um, in the Jain stories of Krishna. It's actually um, it's Jarasandha who is the Prativasudeva. But anyway, going back to the to the Mahabharata. So basically, the story of the Jain Mahabharata is kind of built around this character of Krishna on the one hand. So this is also the reason why sometimes Jain Mahabharatas go under the name of the Harivamsha Purana or a Harivamsha story. Um, <clears throat> And then a third name that we sometimes have for um, literary works narrating the same story is that of a Niminata Purana or a Niminata Charita. Um, and this refers to the 22nd Tirthankara. Um, why is this important? Well, his story is actually also integrated within these Jain Mahabharatas or Jain Harivamshas. I hope I'm not confusing you too much. So actually, the, the character, the 22nd Tirthankara is the younger... Um, the younger nephew of uh, of Krishna, and um, I I've seen that there's a lot of uh, people from the Jain community in the audience. I'm sure you've you've heard the story of um, how Krishna was important, or I think at least some of you will know the story how Krishna was important in you know in instigating the diksha, the moment where Niminata decides to renounce the world and eventually will become a Tirthankara. Um, so we have this small episode in the life of Krishna that is connected to um, Neminata. Uh, but in fact, the story of Krishna as it's told in these um, Jain Mahabharatas is not so different. Um, I mean, it's 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 very much a similar character as we know him from, you know, from from say the 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 Bhagavat Srimad Bhagavata Purana. Um, you know, he's he's we have the story of him being uh, in, in the Gokula and then later on um, becoming a king um, and fighting along with the Pandavas um, in this Jain Mahabharata. Um, and now one further thing that I needed to mention, and this is actually where the um, Jain, where, where the lecture of Simon will intersect the most with that of Helene, and that is in the character. So in these Jain Puranas, you have a special type of characters that occur, and they are called Vidyadaras. Um, and Vidyadaras are ba basically beings, they are, they are humans, just like, uh, like you and me, but they have special powers called um, a Vidya, so they are the carrier, carriers of Vidyas. Now, um, these Vidyas can be obtained through meditating, um, and they kind of when when they um when you acquire such a vidya they manifest themselves in a in a female form and they give they give you if you've acquired such a vidya they can give you a specific magical power and this can be the power to become invisible or to change your appearance to be, become uh, small or large etc so such characters appear in this jain mahabharata um, and the Vid Vidyadaras are also the main characters, you could say, in the textual corpus that um, 
Helene de Jong here will uh, talk about uh, tonight, that is uh, on the Dharma Pariksha tradition. Um, so the Dharma Parikshas represent actually a, a different way in which Jains responded to uh, to these Hindu epics and Puranas. Um, and so here we have a story of two Vidyadaras. So they are like human beings, but they're, they're a bit mischievous. Uh, they have special powers. They also have Vimanas, um, kind of celestial chariots with which they can fly through the air. Um, and what they do is they 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 go to the Brahmin city um, of Pataliputra and they um, have some encounters with Brahmins there. And they um, um, in these encounters they tell they try to convince uh, these Brahmins of all kinds of um, yeah outrageous um, events that happened to them during their lives and when the Brahmins then you know refuse to believe them um, these Vidyadaras say well you know well in in this Purana or in this story of yours you know you had the story of this and this happening and then of course the Brahmins have to accept the story of these uh, Vidyadaras so basically it's all about rejecting some of the you know, more incredulous uh, elements that are found in these uh, Hindu Puranas. So that's the focus of um, of Helene's work. Um, I think I've spoken enough now and I will leave um, the floor now to our first speaker. Sorry for the background noise. <laughs> Being uh, Simon Winant, who will uh, give his lecture on the uh, Jain Mahabharata. So Simon, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you for the occasion uh, for letting me present at this uh, lecture series. Uh, I hope I'm audible to everyone in the audience if they're... Yes, all right, so I shall proceed and share my screen. Um... All right, uh, is the, my, the screen of my presentation visible to all? Okay. So welcome uh, today, um, like I'm Simon, as I mentioned before, I work at Hyant University and funded by FWO, Flanders Research uh, Fund. So my presentation today is Invitation to Bhima's Beheading, Strategies of Suspense. So as Eva has mentioned, uh, just mentioned, uh, Jains have been adapting the stories of Mahabharata and uh, Ramayana for many centuries. And these are stories that are very familiar to Indian, not just Jains, but to Indian audiences at large. Um, there is this very famous quote by A.K. Ramanujan, how no Indian person ever hears the story of Mahabharata or Ramayana for the first time. And so if an audience is so familiar with these stories and all the episodes contain these stories and will know, you know, can predict in advance how they will end, how do you add suspense? How do you add that narrative tension, that anticipation for, you know, how will this you know, this, the events of this episode transpire when you already know the end, you know. And to that, you know, to answer that question or address that question, I am looking at um, today at uh, David Prabhaswari's Spanavichaita, a 13th century adaptation uh, by a Jain monk of the Mahabharata. And he uses certain uh, I mean, um, plot devices that actually feel somewhat, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say modern. I mean, they do appear in, in the literature, but it's, uh, he introduces them uh, to uh, 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 tension. So he changes character points of view. Uh, for instance, when you focus on a certain character, the hero, uh, who is engaged in a certain act action, and then before the action is resolved, he cuts to a different point, uh, different character, different part uh, in the narration, leaving the, the, the action unresolved, and only cutting back later. He also, so a sort of pseudo cliffhanger, so, uh, so as to speak. And um, he also uses fake out deaths. Like for instance, a character appears to have died, but actually um, uh, lo and behold, a couple of um, shlokas later, it turns out to be alive to introduce some tension. So I will be focusing on two episodes from the Panavichaita in which these two aforementioned techniques appear. One is an relatively original episode, as in Dev Rasuri appears to have invented this episode himself, how Arjuna rescues uh, the Vidyadri princess Prabhavati. But he also uses the same techniques for uh, the very well-known episode of Bhima slaying the Asura uh, Bakar. 
All right, so first I will briefly give some context of the Mahabharata, just uh, enough to uh, make uh, the, the additional changes uh, understandable and uh, easy to follow along. And then I will uh, explain more about Defer Bhaskari's Bhanavacharita. So the Mahabharata, as you know, is about the succession feud between the five Bhanavas and their cousins, uh, the Kauravas over the rule of um, the Kuru kingdom. It's a vast work. And all of you will be familiar with the, the, the more like the large events of the plot of the Mahabharata, so the fatal dice game uh, between the Pandavas and the Kauravas, in which they lose their kingdom and their mutual wife Draupadi is humiliated, their exile in the forest for 13 years, their return from exile, and how they demand the kingdom back, but are refused even an inch of land and are forced to fight their relatives in the internecine conflict which the Pandavas, um, Pandavas ultimately prevail, but at a tragic cost. So the episode that I'm discussing uh, that's been adapted is The Slaying of Bakram. And this uh, adaptation is found in the first book of the Mahabharata, the Adi Parvam. Because in the Adi Parvam, there's already a first exile, not the actual Vanvas, but another exile of the Pandavas. So when the Pandavas... Uh, the Kauravas grew jealous to the Pandavas. They uh, come up with this scheme to assassinate the Pandavas. They invite the Pandavas to stay at this palace in um, uh, Varanavata, the city of Varanavata. But uh, the Pandavas stay there, but little do they know that the, the palace has been made out of wax and is easily combustible. Eventually, they find, find out about this uh, plot and they manage to escape before the um, for, for just before the uh, the, the Kauravas uh, lit, light the palace on fire. The Pandavas um, escape and they disguise themselves uh, and travel around in incognito so as to avoid further assassination attempts. Along, along the travels, they eventually end up in the village of Ike Chakra. And there, in disguise as Brahmins and begging for the food, they stay uh, with this Brah Brahmin family. And one day, when all the Pandavas had gone out for on their begging rounds. Um, Kunti and Bhima stay at home. And there they overhear uh, this conversation that the host family is having. So it turns out that the village of Ekechakra is sort of terrorized by this demon, Bakr. Uh, Bakr uh, has sort of, um, sort of blackmailing the, the, the inhabitants of the village to provide him uh, with... Um, a weekly offering of food along with a human sacrifice in exchange for protection. And uh, the villagers of um, the inhabitants of Egechaka have agreed among themselves that each household should, you know, alternate in offering up one member of the family, one human sacrifice. And this time, the host of the Pandavas turn has come. And amongst themselves, they discuss, like, who should sacrifice himself to Bakr. And it's very much as... Um, the tension is not so much in the slaying of Baka, it's about um, who sacrifices himself for the common good, who is more important. Is the, the husband who is uh, supporting the, the fam uh, family more important? Is um, the wife more important? It's, uh, it's a sort of um, it's a debate that sort of de develops. When Kunti overhears this, she volunteers to send Bhima instead as sacrifice. Bhima should go to sacrifice and he will defeat the, de the demon Baka. And when Yudhishtha, the eldest Pandava, returns, he's angry at uh, uh, Kunti. Why are you sending Bhima? You're risking our, you know, you, you risk, uh, you know, losing our our, our 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 brother, our greatest asset uh, in our rivalry against uh, the Kauravas. But Kunti points out that it's a uh, Kshatri's duty to, um, you know, to help, you know, other people, the other people in the, the Varna system, and it's sort of a, uh, an answer to Yudhishtha. So it's very much a sort of dialogue about uh, a, a person's place in a family and a person's place in uh, the Wagner system. So this is um, sort of the, the moral of the story. Bhima should go and help out because it's accept his duty. So Bhima goes along with the cart, the offering. Uh, Baka um, shows up, sees Bhima eating the food, uh, tries to kill Bhima, but Bhima obviously prevails and kills uh, the, the Asuda Baka. And the story not all right. Uh, now I turn to Dev Prabhasuri and the Pandavichaita. Uh, why is this adaptation interesting? It's interesting in that is the real, arguably the real 
first real Jain Mahabharata in Sanskrit. And when I say real, I mean that, um, as Eva has mentioned, um, in most adaptations of Mahabharata are actually sub narratives in these universal histories. And the Jains uh, depict like Jinnah, the Jinnah Nemi, and the, the Baladeva, Vasudeva as the more, most important characters. And the Banavas are eventually sh sometimes show up, but they're not the main focus of the narrative. And Banava Charita is the first narrative in Sanskrit that we know of, excellent uh, Jaina adaptation that reverses the relationship. The Banavas are front and center. So yeah, many of the episodes from the Mahabharata feature prominently in this uh, Banava Charita. But how poetry a work like this is not just a, a, a vehicle for um, uh, to to um, to communicate Jain values or to uh, show off uh, your skill in Sanskrit, and also try to entertain. And Deva Basuri uses these strategies of the suspense in what is it I see as a clear attempt to make to inject some entertainment in the story. And the two episodes I will be discussing are the rescue of Prabhavati and Bhima slaying Bakum. So, so just for some context, I will first discuss the episode of um, uh, Arjuna rescuing Prabhavati, which appears to be an uh, um, original episode by uh, Deva Basuri. So uh, there's 14, 18 chapters in the um, Bhagavad Gita, like echoing the, the 18 paragraphs of the Mahabharata. So in the fourth saga, we find ends with the Bhagavad all five of them marrying the Abhidhi. And in the fifth saga, uh, um, did, uh, Arjuna is forced to go on uh, a pilgrimage because he broke this sort of gov covenant the five Pandavas made after marrying Draupadi, which is that no one should disturb the other Pandava, like should Pandava while he's in a room making love with Draupadi. But at a certain point, when uh, Yudhishthira's bow, Gandiva bow, is um, in the room where Draupadi and Yudhishthira are, you know, engaged in love making. He barges in to grab his bow and he breaks a compact and he has to, you know, atone for that. So he goes on this Jain pilgrimage. He visits all these various Adithas, um, among which like Meru, uh, Shatrinjaya, Sameta. And then along his travels, he befriends this Vidyata, uh, Mani Chuda. And Mani Chuda, um, just before he was crowned king, was, uh, you know, banished and, uh, by a relative, not a Vidyadra magical powers and was forced to um to go in exile and Arjuna takes it on himself to help out uh, Manichuda back to his uh, kingdom so Arjuna meditates um he uh, acquires his vidyas and he helps out um, he restores Manichuda back to the to, to his uh, original kingdom so it is, this episode is somewhat inspired by, by like the, the Tirtha Yatris in the Mahabharata, but it's still, it's very much Jain. Now, Manichud has a sister, Prabhavati, who is married to King Emangada. And just as Arjuna's uh, pilgrimage is about to end, uh, he's flying on his Vimana, he's just returned from uh, Samitha, I think, and he's from his Vimana, he spots this distressed crowd crying. He turns his eyes to the crowd and sends this Vidyadra friend whom he can summon with his uh, Vidya powers and kisses her, goes down, checks out what's, what's been happening and reports back to Arjuna. And it turns out that Prabhavati, sister of um, Manichuda, so Arjuna's good friend, has been abducted last night. So Hemangada was sleeping and his wife was abducted by his unknown assailant. And he didn't manage to, to, get, you know, to uh, retrieve uh, Prabhavati in time, and she's missing. So Arjuna, because uh, it's the sister of his good friend Manichuda, decides to take it upon himself to rescue Prabhavati. And here we find this character uh, uh, switch. So all throughout the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the fifth, the fifth um, Sarga of this Pano Charita, we've been following Arjuna along all the time. And now suddenly we find a switch in character perspective. So with uh, Jishnu Gan, the king, i.e. him, uh, Mangada, did not go ahead, like he stays put. And for 30 shl shlokas, we focus on his perspective. So Himangada's uh, uh, horsemen, immediately after uh, Arjuna's gone, spot uh, Queen Prabhavati gathering flowers in some nearby meadow. And Himangada rushes out to, uh, to, to find his uh, 
his wife, and just as he's about to, you know, talk to her, a cobra bites her, and she uh, faints, and the physicians uh, rush to the scene, but they don't manage to revive her, and the manga cradling, cradling his dead wife is mourning her loudly, seeing a lot of pathos, and Himangara decides to take his own life in a sort of reversal of sati, like whereas they usually it's the, the wife following a, a husband in death, it's reversed. And his royal retinue also decides to join him. And they build funeral pyres. And just as the, the fires are lit, Arjuna arrives on his earth, Himana with Prabhavati. And he uses his magical vidyas to extinguish uh, the, the fires. And it turns out that the dead um, uh, Prabhavati um, Amangada was cradling whilst ascending the funeral pile was a fake Prabhavati, a perpensha Prabhavati. Amangada and the real Prabhavati are reunited, and the Vidyadara friend of Arjuna tells about Arjuna's rescue, how another rival Vidyadara, Meganada, captured um, Prabhavati and um, how Arjuna you know, retrieved her, defeated Meganada. And Meganala dispatched his fake Prabhavati so that um, Mangada would give up his quest to find his true wife. Because Meganala wanted to marry uh, Prabhavati for himself. So, interesting episode enough. But it's what's interesting is that uh, Dev Basuri uses these exact same techniques, like a switch of in character's perspective, uh, perspective and a fake out death to um, add tension and renew a, a, a back episode. Which, um, so in the sixth saga, we find. Um, so now we'll discuss the Jain adaptation of the, the back episode here. And in the sixth saga, the Pandavas uh, uh, lose the, the, the fatal game of dice, they go into exile. But along a couple of months into the exile, they are called back by Duryodhana. Duryodhana sends his message apologizing and uh, giving back the kingdom to them. He wants to atone for the, the heinous acts at the dice game. The Pandavas accepts. And they uh, accept his invitation to stay in the village of Varnavata along the way back to Hastinapuri. But of course, it's an uh, assassination attempt. The, 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 the powers are staying at is uh, inflammable. They find out about this, um, this pl plot and they escape again just before the, the palace has been lit on fire and they go into exile again. So Deva Basuri combines the two exiles in one exile. So Draupadi is all, they're already married to Draupadi, so Draupadi is um, traveling along. At a certain point, they arrive in Eka Chakra, at which they stay disguised. They're not, their true identity is not known. Uh, they stay at Deva Sharman's uh, place, uh, the Brahman from uh, the Mahabharata. But now in the Pandava Chaita, they all have been given names, Deva Sharman. And one day, Kunti overhears uh, Deva Sharman uh, crying, and he, she inquires as to what has, you know, what has happened, why uh, David Sharman is crying. And David Sharman tells how, um, why, because he has to sacrifice like, a family member or himself uh, because this uh, demon Baka uh, demands uh, tribute. And he tells this story. It's, it's, there's no real dialogue, like uh, reflecting on uh, each individual family member's place in society. No, it's more um, it's it's more of an adventure narrative, I'd say. So one day, in a sort of flashback, Baka um, shows up, threatening to crush the village of um, Eka Chakra with um, a rock, which he's able to summon with this vidya. And he just wanted to, to, to you know, test out this vidya. Can I cross the city? And the villagers plead uh, uh, to him to not destroy the village. And he relents in uh, exchange for giving like this tribute, uh, this uh, weekly sacrifice. Um, there's no real dialogue. It's the, the Brahmin's wife and daughter don't really reflect upon the place, the place in society. It's not. This is not the point of this episode, uh, as uh, uh, Deva Basu depicts it. And when Kunti offers uh, to send Bhima instead, um, um, Deva Sharma, not knowing that his guests are the Pandavas says like, oh, but uh, your, your, your son will not be able to defeat Baka because one time, a couple of years ago, a couple of days ago, this uh, months ago, this Jain Muni showed up. The Jain Muni called um, Gevali, which is obviously a reference to the, the um, like a, 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 the sage having realized Gevali uh, Janana. 
So he's uh, endowed with omniscience. So he knows what will happen. And he says that only the Pandavas, when they show up, will be able to defeat Baka. But a couple of uh, days after the Muni visited uh, uh, Ikechakra, they hear that the Pandavas have perished in, uh, in, in the fires of um, Varnavata, of the Lakshagriya. So they despair and they just give in and they resign themselves to the fate of having to offer themselves up to Baka one by one. And Bhima nevertheless sets out, um, decides to go, and Devishanan sets out to pray, just like to say his final goodbye. So he still takes upon himself, like, I'm going to sacrifice myself, but unbeknownst to um, Devishanan, Bhima sets out with a cart with offering to Baka. He goes to Baka's grove. Um, Baka arrives, uh, tries to eat Bhima, but Bhima initially resists. His skin is too uh, tough for uh, Baka's teeth or um, claws. And he managed to, 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 to carry him off. Like he lifts him up with a host of other fellow demons and carries him to his lair. And then there's again a character, uh, 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 switching character perspective. The narrative focuses on David Sharman, just who's just finished praying to the Kula Dev, Devita, his family. And he goes back to his house and he doesn't see Bhima there. And he's sort of, oh, has Bhima gone in my stead? And he feels really guilty, informs the other Pandavas. Uh, it is another the, the Pandavas. And they all set out uh, looking for Bhima. And all along the way, they see this sort of guard of Baka's grove who tells them, oh, Baka has abducted uh, um, Bhima. And not Bhima, this, this, this man that came with the sacrifice. Uh, Yudhishthira tells um, his host, um, David Shalman, who feels guilty not to worry. Like, enough with lamentations. A demon could never subdue my son. How could the darkness ever blot out the sun? And just as they were saying this, something resembling uh, a great boulder fell from the sky, making a whizzing sound. When it hit the ground, the earth shook rocks uh, and oh, rained down. Curious, shocked and curious as to what it could be, they came up to look at it. When they recognized it as Bhima's head by its particular marks, they all loudly began to weep. So there's this tension. Um, Bhima has died. This sort of seems a bit um, uh, incredible. Um, Yudhishthir and Draupadi start to lament. Um, this huge um, scene with lots of pages in, in which uh, Draupadi lifts Bhima's decapitated head, cradles it, and um, you know, laments and bemoans and wails her fate. And they also decide to give up their lives. They start building a uh, funeral pyre, and they hear this huge noise, this roaring, and I think Bacchus come back to finish the job. And just as um, David Shannon was saying, like, um, sort of said, final prayers, Bhima appears for the very eyes, roaring with joy. So it's, again, a fake, fake out death, sort of change of perspective, clearly designed to... Um, um, to introduce tension where there was previously little tension, especially if it's an episode that can, you know is very well known. All are surprised. Um, they're united, but Draupadi still um, was distracted for some reason. Uh, and Bhima pulls a prank on Draupadi, you know, covering her eyes. Uh, uh, and sort of, she, she is in a shock. She uh, uh, thinks it's as a bucket is trying to, to uh, devour her, and Bhima reveals, and they, uh, they they hug, and all are united. The king of Ekechaka arrives, uh, congratulating the Pandavas, and then two Vidyata show up, and they, uh, their family, the family members of Baka, and they relate to how, um, how, how they witnessed Bhima defeating Baka. So these are strategies of suspense. So it's not. It's not so much that David Prabhasu is trying to communicate ethical values with these episodes. He actually uses the Jain doctrine of like omniscience as sort of to add some narrative suspense. Like, okay, the Pandavas will prevail, and they add something that's contrary to the, the, the expectation of the audience, like Bhima dying. Uh, this Jain character perspective, the trope of illusion and the captain head is, is common enough. So it's there is there are stories that use that trope. For instance, uh, in the Ramayana. At a certain point in the Uda Karanda, um, Ravana conscious of this illusion of um, um, Rama's decapitated head and shows it to Sita. Uh, but she's, Sita is afterwards co comforted by some uh, the, the women in the Antapura of uh, Lanka who say it's just an illusion, but Rama is still alive. But 
in that case, it's not used as um, as a drop of suspense. I, I, I suspect it's more used to uh, to illustrate like um, to to conjure up pathos and to um, show a Sita's resolve and you know faithfulness even in inside of this uh, you know gruesome uh, uh, site. Ramas the Kevin has she still doesn't give in to Ravana. So I think it's important to sort of focus on these. Um, strategies of suspense because I think it's um these are not just vehicles for moral instruction um and if you read closely enough we can sort of try to uh we can sort of distinguish like by using this real strategies we can sort of distinguish like what is moral instruction what is uh, uh emulation of other particular tropes and what is just entertainment so it's a very particular point that we still need to be aware of that, that I mentioned that ent entertainment is still present in these stories all right, um, I hope I did not uh, exceed my uh, 20 minutes by too much. And I would like to um, uh, yeah, give the floor to Helene. Yeah. Thank you very much, Simon. No, you did not. You did uh, quite fine. Um, so yeah, this was a, a very um, interesting uh, paper um, for the members uh, in the audience, please. Uh, write your uh, questions in the chat and um, we will address these at the end of the two lectures. And then now, uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce the second speaker um, of tonight, um, Dr. Helene de Jonkere, um, who will um, bring us uh, some new parts from her research on the Dharma Pariksha tradition. So Helene, um, let me see what, yeah, there you are. Um, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, thank you, Eva, uh, for this. Um, so yes, for for some of you, I've seen um, this will be sort of a continuation of what you've heard from me from uh, the same corpus, which is the Dharma Pariksha. Um, and um, new research uh, that is very much uh, still forming in my head or at least um, uh, I'm uh, trying to figure out what I want to do with this I think I have not done what I wanted to do sorry um, <laughs> so let me try again yes you see, you see your screen Helen. yeah you only see my slide, right? Only your slide, yes. Yes, perfect, great. So um, in this presentation, I will try to uh, do, do a bit of comparative literature studies, because um, I think, um, you know, questions of what, what do these stories mean to us uh, are important. Uh, I myself do not come from the Indian context, let alone from the Indian medieval context. Um, so engaging with literary studies, literary theory, also from this part, this side of the world, I think brings um, interesting conclusions into uh, the meaning of, of these stories. Um, I'm also going to attempt to uh, combine uh, aspects of the elite and the popular. Um, these are dreaded terms uh, because there is no clear bifurcation between these two spheres, you may say, and uh, many scholars have pointed that out. Yet, I think engaging with these concepts um, can lead to interesting uh, conclusions, exactly to point out how they go together. Um, and then thirdly, I'm going to talk about uh, the body um, within a religious tradition that essentially aims to discard the body because of its karmic implications. Um, and I should also note that my images are not directly related to any of the material I'm talking, I mean, to the Dharma Parikshas, but they are meant to be invocative um, in this presentation. Um, I'm thankful to Eva for giving an introduction to the Dharma Pariksha as a genre or as a textual tradition that engaged with um, Puranas and, and a Jain perspective on these Puranas. I'm discussing today uh, the text by Amita Gati that was written in the 11th century. It's a Sanskrit text and that was translated into or adapted into Sanskrit, uh, Old Hindi and, and Gujarati. Um, and there's also other versions of the same narrative in, in other languages and that I've uh, discussed in my dissertation that will hopefully uh, come out at some point. 
Um, the story is indeed about two vidyadaras. Um, they are looking for the truth, which is of course the Jain truth. And um, they, uh, I mean, one vidyadara called Manu Viga is trying to help his friend Pavana Viga to um, realize that Jainism is right and that the Jain Vratas are right. So this is also um, a lesson for, for lay Jains um, about uh, the, the correct path and then taking up the lay vows directed against the Brahmins. Um, <clears throat> Amida Gadi calls his text a kavya at the end of the, of the, of the text. Um, but it's also um, very much uh, like a dharma, dharma kata uh, in that it ends with a uh, didactic and uh, conversive message, namely to take up the lay vows, as I said. And so the story um, or the text uh, relates to uh, other dharma kathas, the brihat katha kosha, uh, and, and this whole narrative world of the Jains, which is which is complex and um open to lots of studies still. So uh, tips for you who are listening and interested. Um, I want to present one story uh, and possibly another one as well um, that illustrates the grotesque body um, as a trope in the Dharma Parikshas um, and, and, and how that might work. So uh, at some point in the text, the two Vidyadaras, Manu Vega and Pavana Vega, are going into the city of Pataliputra dressed as um, Shvetambaras, dressed in white robes. The Brahmins see them and uh, see that they are different, so they approach them and ask them uh, who they are, who their guru is, and also what arguments they have learned from this guru. The two Vidyadaras, or Manu Viga rather, says uh, we don't have a guru, um, and we also don't have any arguments. Um, and this actually might be a critique on the Shvetambaras, considering that this uh, text by Amitagati uh, is a, a Digambara text, but I leave that uh, open uh, at this moment. Um, and they say, uh, they explain why they are dressed as Shvetambaras in the following way. We are two brothers, sons of prosperous sheep owner who came from Vrikshagrama in the Abhira region. Once, because a shepherd had caught a fever, our father sent us to the forest to let the sheep graze. There we saw a wood apple tree full of big fruits. And when I saw that, my mind became obsessed with eating those fruits. But I was too hungry to climb the tree. So I cut off my head and threw it to the top of the tree. Um, and then after I had filled my belly with the fruits, my head came back down from the top of the tree and reattached to my body. I went back to the sheep and found my brother asleep. I asked him, where have all the sheep gone? They must have gone somewhere where I was sleeping, he said. Our father will be angry when we return home. So we should go to another region where they will not recognize us. And so we changed into the clothes of Shvetambaras um, and uh, came to this region and to the city of Pataliputra. Um, the story is completely absurd, just like the picture I've added here, um, and, and shows some elements that will come back in the theory of bhakti, which I will use, uh, namely this, this aspect of gluttony, um, the head being cut off from the belly, and the belly being sort of uh, the uh, symbol of, of life and of generating life, um, and it may, might invoke laughter. It's totally absurd. This story is then set within a series of stories uh, that is meant to disprove uh, the Brahmanical Puranic tradition. Um, so first you get this story, and that is then um, compared to the story of Ravana, who in his tapas for Shiva cuts off nine of his ten um, heads. There's also mention of the blood that falls onto the earth as, as adding to that uh, grotesque imagery. Um, there's then the story of Dadi Mukha, and the text says that this is a story from the Mahabharata. Um, <clears throat> and, and it's not so it's not me who says this, but it's the text that says that. The story of Dadi Mukha talks about a thing, <laughs> a head being born and being alive, uh, just just a head. 
um, who um, needs to find a wife. So he marries a poor girl, of course, a poor girl, because it's just a head. And at some point, this girl takes him to a gambling house. Um, in this in this gambling house, two rocks start to fight and they cut off each other's head. So Daddy Mukha attaches himself being a head to one of these bodies and so he can live on. Uh, again, it's uh, funny in the sense that it is uh, absurd and weird. Um, after this, you get uh, just a brief comparison to uh, the stories of Angada, Jarasandha and Skanda. Uh, which are supposed to be known, as, as Simon also said about in, in about his texts, um, as characters that exist in uh, only as parts of a body and then uh, unify. Um, so what do we do with these stories? Um, there are different ways to approach this, and I just put up these books um, to tell you what I'm not doing. <laughs> So um, the book by Lee Siegel is very interesting to get an introduction of comic episodes um, in Indian literature. I could uh, put my Dharma Pariksha stories there to sort of point out how, how there's a tradition of, of sort of uh, deformity in, in Indian literature. Um, but I think, yeah, there's more interesting things to do than just adding it to his work. And there's a book by David Schulman um, that I need to read, basically, which is why uh, I'm not engaging with it. But I did notice that he also refers to Bakhtin. And so that uh, I will definitely need to read it to, to make something more out of this. Right, to rephrase, uh, to come then to the, to the grotesque body, um, the, it, this is about, I mean, the stories I've mentioned are about heads. Uh, and only heads, uh, deformed bodies not being complete, and uh, then finishing by combining, uh, et cetera. And this is exactly what Bakhtin describes in his theory of the grotesque body, which um, is part of his theory of the carnivalesque um, that he introduces in a study of Rabelais. Uh, Rabelais, the French uh, writer who wrote uh, about Pantagruel and, and Gargantua. Um, and I hope the, the image you see sort of evokes the text by the, the, yeah, the text by Rabelais. Um, Bakhtin talks about the grotesque body when he discusses um, popular humor and folk culture in Europe in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. For, um, Ra for sorry, for Bakhtin, that period had um, a type of humor that we did not find or that he does not find anymore after the 17th century. Um, it is a humor that is uh, public, um, includes all layers of society, but also does not function um, according to those official social relations. Um, it is a laughter that is meant to uh, subvert those relations. Um, and then he says that after the 17th century or from that point onwards, laughter becomes individual and loses its sort of um, universal cosmic uh, meaning. Um, before that, and that's the sort of humor that he says that Rabelais is using and displaying as a satire, um, laughter um, resists fear. Uh, it resists that, it resists seriousness as well. This is sort of interesting to mention in the context of the uh, Dharma Parikshas, because um, every time Manoviga is telling a story like the ones I've just told you, he says to the Brahmins, no, I'm not scared of you. I'm not fearful to be telling you this. So he's sort of resisting that. Well, we, we can see uh, similarities. What to do with it is, is, is of course, a different thing. Um, he also says that time plays and laughs, and this refers to this idea that um, with time there is birth, but there's also death and there's rebirth, and so there's there's a play of, of what is possible, and, and uh, this image re returns and or returns is there as well in, um, in the Indian context. Um, he then 
talks about the grotesque body as um, central to this sort of, uh, to the imagery of this type of laughter and um, characterizes this grotesque body as um, focusing on the nose, the mouth, the ears, prolonging limbs, the belly, the genitals, also deformity, exaggeration, swallowing, etc. So um, those are characteristics you can notice. Um, the grotesque body is a body that is in, in the act of becoming, it is unfinished, it is created and creating. And so um, it uh, symbolizes the regenerating principle. It symbolizes creation and change um, in that sort of cosmos of laughter. It also dispels the atmosphere of gloomy and false seriousness enveloping the world and its phenomena and its subversive. And, and, um, and so this is Bakhtin's theory um, that I now want to sort of uh, quickly apply to, to what we just saw. Okay. Um, this is sort of how I see this played out in the example. Um, we have the literary image of, of the head separately from the belly and then connecting, or of the only head of the deformed body. And this type of image, uh, if we follow Bakhtin, um, signifies the reversal of the upper and the lower. Um, in a way, you could say that uh, the head, which is this attached, um, needs the belly to be fed um, still. So there's this sort of reversal uh, of these things. The absurd, which becomes, uh, which is depicted at least as true, as logical in these stories. And it is that type of reversal that enables um, to criticize the Brahmins, that enables to also subvert social relations. Um, and that's this idea that is behind the work of Rabelais, according to Bakhtin. Um, I've used this image because the monks in Rabelais' work exactly uh, end up in the same situations as our Brahmins, namely that they do not know anymore wh who to follow. <laughs> um, so uh, there's a, a funny similarity there as well. <clears throat> Another story um, that we may use here is uh, one that some of you know, uh, one that some of you of some of others uh, don't like, but it's there in the Dharma Pariksha, and it's it's it invokes the same imagery because um, of the sort of focus on the on the genitals, um, which are also important to this. Uh, carnivalesque aspect that Bakhtin describes. So, Brahma, in loss of his creation, which is of course the world, was wandering around the earth when he stumbled upon Agastya, sitting under a tree. Agastya saluted him and asked him why he was wandering around. Brahma then told him that he was looking for his creation and could not find it. And then Agastya replied that it should go into his water pot that stood next to him and that uh, and that he would find it there. Inside Agastya's water pot, Brahma saw Vishnu lying on the leaf of a fig tree, and Brahma asked the god why his belly was so round. Vishnu told him that when he saw how Brahma's creation was being destroyed in an ocean, he put it inside his belly as to protect it. Brahma thanked him and following Vishnu's advice, entered his belly. And there, finally seeing his creation again, Brahma felt even more happy. After a while, he wanted to get back out of the belly through Vishnu's lotus navel, but a hair of his scrotum got stuck in a narrow navel. And from then onwards, Brahma is famous in the world as the lotus seated. Um, these are not my words, nor these of uh, temporary, uh, sorry, contemporary chains, but those of Amitagati in the 11th century. Um, so yeah, we have the same um, image that, that actually comes from the Hindu mythology, namely that the world is being swallowed. It's also sort of a, a popular image um, if we follow Bakhtin. And, and here the sort of, um, yeah, the overturning of the, of the, of the god Brahma by, by focusing, by zooming in on his, on his scrotum, uh, actually. Um, again, in order to uh, invoke this laughter. 
Now, um, I, I hope you, you maybe have laughed and, and that you can laugh because um, we are all lay people. Um, but there's a problem with laughter, uh, according to the Jaina tradition. Um, it is described as a quasi passion, one of the nine Lukasayas. Um, uh, sorry, um, that that is leads that is uh, in, bad in karma theory. Um, it's also described as a uh, nisya, um, one of the uh, psychophysical conditions that leads to untruthful speech in uh, the Shvetamra canon. And it's also uh, linked to the laukika, to, to worldly sphere, and instead of the alaukika, non-worldly sphere, which uh, is uh, where we find the, the Jaina teachings, the Agami, the Agama teachings um, that lead us to, to, to the spiritual uh, solution, let's say. Um, <clears throat> so it's problematic. Now, what can we do with it? So an easy solution would be to say that um, we are all on a spiritual path and we are gradually lessening our quasi passions. And so actually at this moment, it is okay to laugh. Um, that's an option. I'm not, I mean, I'm not refusing it because as I said, uh, I'm not finished with this uh, thought process, um, but I don't really like it because um, it does not solve the problem of uh, Jain Muni, namely uh, Amitagati. Acharya even, um, to invoke laughter in his audience. Why, yeah, why would he want to do that <laughs> if he also wants to lead them uh, further on their spiritual path? Another way, um, I think, and uh, yeah, is to follow, to follow Bhaktin, I think, um, in understanding that um, laughter um, is not necessarily something that has to be uh, psychophysiological. So in Bakhtin's explanation, um, the comic is, um, is a, has a sociological uh, outcome and, and works symbolically. Um, his theory is not that uh, of Freud, for example, who, who believes that laughter has um, psychological results. Um, Instead, it is a sort of um, symbolic uh, recognizing and, and uh, universe in which um, social relations can change and which subversion can happen. So perhaps there's not, uh, we don't have to have an incoherence with Jain karmic theory that understands uh, the soul's so spiritual status as a function of its psychophysical condition. Um, we may say that um, the image of the grotesque body in these stories is a temporary symbolic reference for readers to understand that the fool can be logical, but only temporarily in the play of time, just like the Brahmin can be logical uh, in the play of time only and not uh, on in the larger level. Um, we can also point out then that this temporariness is emphasized in the in the overall structure of the narrative, um, which binds each of these smaller stories that I've just told you within a larger frame story in which the um, didactic uh, telling or the didacticism is very clear and, and straightforward as well. Um, and in that sense, the Dharma Parikshas are different from Rabelais uh, texts, and and um, I would like to see how the Dvurtakyana does a better job at making a clear comparison. Um, with this temporary opening up, we could also say that it opens up to the world of the popular, of laughter, uh, and that the frame then um, sort of illustrates the dialogic relationship, um, which is also a very uh, Bakhtinian concept. Um, between the learned and the popular discourse within uh, Jain literature as a non-problematic, non-problematic thing. Um, finally, and I see that time is passing, um, I've also put a rasa theory on this slide because of course um, that is <laughs> um, essential to understanding Indian literature and especially if Amitagati calls his work Kavya, we should um, here, unfortunately, quickly take this into account. Um, 
Hasya, um, according to Bharata, is the is sorry is the rasa which has as its nature uh, the stable emotion of hasa, and is invoked by, for example, cross dressing, deformity, etc. So um, this is why I say uh, this this laughter in in, in the Bactinian idea is is found as well in in, in theories of laughter in India. Um, but um, rasa, so that's important to note, rasa theory in its earlier understandings, um, according to Pollock, um, did not refer to an emotion in the audience. So rasa means taste, you taste um, in a, a poetic work or a piece of art. But in the earlier understanding, it did not refer to tasting by the audience. Um, and so that's also how Bhojara, contemporary of Amitagati, understood rasa indeed. So if there is no uh, identification of the audience with the rasa, in which is laughter, in the text, then again, it does not need to be problematic for, um, for a writer to, to invoke laughter. And um, laughter can then, you know, perform all these functions I just explained with Bakhtin uh, without actually the identification by the audience with it. Um, that's a possibility. Now, uh, uh, other contemporaries of Amitagati actually wrote that Rasa did uh, have an effect on the audience. So then again, we, we come up with a sort of difficult uh, way to, to get out of that. Um, you could say that laughter is not a dominant rasa in this work, um, but that's again not very not very um, satisfactory as an explanation. Um, so that's where I think I need to <laughs> I need to do more work. Um, a final slide then. Um, about this grotesque, I think a, a question I would like to answer is, yeah, what does it do to to later um, versions of this Dharma Pariksha who perhaps do not call it uh, kavya, so it is not necessarily um, poetic invocation. So, so then, what is going on? Um, in which context? And 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 also within the text, what sort of other imagery do we see along with this uh, grotesque body image, and um, in other art? So I think um, this image sort of perhaps also nicely shows what I wanted to present to you. Namely, it shows um, it's from from Ranakpur, the famous temple in Ranakpur, where you see um, a five-bodied uh, male being, which is supposed to be Kichaka. Um, and he is uh, well deformed, obviously. And perhaps this is a representation of this grotesque body uh, in the center of the absurd cosmos of laughter, um, which is um, in which contradictions are um, present, namely there's both demons as well as apsaras, so there's like heaven and and the lower world are together. Um, and even these apsaras, if you zoom in, their legs look very weird, almost animal-like. So I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but perhaps this is then, you know, you look up at the temple and you see this um, absurd cosmos that makes you understand that um, the conventional is, or I mean, I now say the conventional, but that's, um, taken truths are not necessarily truth, and it opens you up to realizing um, the real truth, which is that of Jainism. Um, so I'll stop there and look at you again, because I've only seen my own presentation for now. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you very much, uh, Helene, for this uh, interesting lecture on on grotesque and uh, and hasya in uh, in the, your uh, Dharma Pariksha. Uh, tradition. So for the um, people in the audience, um, we now open the, the the kind of dialogue part of uh, this session. And you are welcome to, um, <clears throat> to post your questions in the uh, question and answer box. Um, 
Helene, maybe I think you can you see the question and answer box? Yeah. So there was already one uh, interesting comment uh, by Stephen Vos, um, uh, referring you to uh, one of the articles of uh, Anne Monius on love, violence, and the aesthetics of disgust. And I'll, I'll just read it. She examines debates between Jane and Shaiva poet aesthetes over the proper progression of the rasas. Jane's and Shaiva's differed over the order of invoking Shringara, Hasya, and Bhibhatsa. And Jane authors used Shringara to draw in the reader, quickly turning it to Bhibhatsa. Um, making you feel bad for being drawn into something salacious, turning it to Hasya to give the audience the proper distance from such lokika things, which made a space for vairagya and then renunciation. So if Amitagati is calling his work Kavya, then perhaps his work as a, uh, as a literary aesthete is what is driving his evocation of the aestheticized emotions. Um, Helene, can you, can you comment? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Steve, for this. Um, I'm I'm aware of Anmonius's work on these topics. Um, I didn't read that exact article, so thank thanks for the reference. Um, you yes. So this is this is very interesting, and it may well be true. Um, yet I still believe there's a problem because we cannot explain. Um, in my opinion, the the recurrence of this type of um imagery only by by referring to aesthetic theory um you know do all of the readers know the aesthetic theory do all of the rewriters know the aesthetic theory um what about and then you would have to look in all these churnies etc if, if that happens there as well um i think it it gives part of the of the picture but but i do believe still that it's interesting to open the discussion up to uh, Bakhtin or others, uh, if you want, yeah. Okay, um, so if you have mm. members of the audience, if you have questions, Simon, do you want to? Yeah, but I just wanted to remark on, on Elaine's use of these um, grotesque uh, images, because it sort of reminded me, uh, like I was in India like last month, uh, and I went to visit Jaisalmer, like the, the Jain temples of Jaisalmer, and I was just inside the Jain temple, gazing at the Tatankas, you know, doing my production. And at a certain point, I just saw this statue of this god. I forgot to ask the guy like which god it specifically was, but it was this god with comically large phallus. And it felt so out of place within, you know, a Jain temple. I mean, the Tatankas are nude, but they're sort of modest. I mean, it's not really, they're proportional. They're not like, uh, you know, like more like a Greek statue rather than this you know, comically large, so it's, I mean, it's still there. They still use that iconography, you know, uh, how we sort of relate that to your theory of the grotesque because it's just topsy-turvy thing. Is this Bakhtin also uh, comment on phallic images or is it just like only topsy-turvy and the belly and and, and, and the, the head? Um, okay, so for, for Bakhtin, it's definitely also uh, phallic images. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the head... <clears throat> Is not there for him. It's more like the belly and the bowels mm -hmm. and the genitals, um, mm -hmm. the nose. Um, but yeah, I think we can sort of try, and, you know, mm -hmm. reinterpret it in mm -hmm. a different context. So, yeah. Um, okay, I have a, a question for for both of you. What strikes me in um, both of your papers is that you approach the, the text or the corpus that you are studying, um, not just from, I mean, we are here in a, mm. you know, we're a part in a, of, of a series on Jainism and Jain studies, is that both of you seem to um, take the approach of more of a literary studies or literature studies. Um, and that's, yeah. Um, could you comment on that or 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 um is this a deliberate choice of of uh, either of you not to just view it as a mm -hmm. say a Jane text do yeah. you mind if i go first uh yeah, sure. yes uh i think it's definitely clear i mean also my, i actually wanted to um also include some discussion about um you know what do sanskrit literary theorists have to say about uh the use of non-linear narrative so i've been reading a bit like uh 
but so Natalie Shasta and some te- works, but they mainly talk about like um, theater, like plays, Sanskrit plays. And uh, so, and there is sort of like, there's this discussion about like um, Vishkambas and Praveshaka sort of transitional scenes that uh, are, des- uh, you know, designed to communicate uh, certain uh, uh, information or um, to transition between scenes, but it's not exactly directly applicable to Kavya. To like Kavya, that is not meant to be performed in the same way, like a mimetic performance, like a, a play. Is. Play, a play is like to use a Greek concept, like mimesis, you present it directly. The character speaks, whereas this, like, um, like David Peras, who is Bangladeshi, it's a Kavya. It probably must have been recited, but it's, it, it's more closely to use the Aristotelian concept of like a diegesis, like it's, it's told. It's narrated rather than acted out, and so I wanted to to, to delve more deeply into that and see if if there's been you know um, Sanskrit theories that actually talk about like both construction and not just about like like interlocutors and and, and narrators, but just also like uh, non-linear narratives. But I think, but I didn't find enough to really confidently make a to really incorporate incorporate it because I feel like. I didn't find it yet, like it's a satisfactory material, and but absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. So, because I can't really uh, uh, bruise the entire corpus of Sanskrit literary theory to find that. I mean, that would be a tall order that falls well beyond the scope of any paper, even. But I think it's, I think there must be something out there that discusses like non narrative, but is that relatively less present because um, in the literary theory starts. With Nat Shasta, but it's because it's plays, which and plays are do tend to favor linear narratives, right? Because uh, just like the, the, the whereas like in uh, the rise of the, the novel, like the print technology and uh, film and modern media, it's easier to uh, to make non-linear narratives, and you can use uh, to communicate to to not confuse the audience, and still you know have them be capable of following the narrative along. Oh, I just. Uh, just a brief aside. Oh, uh, all right. Uh, Maria, that is a question. Uh, but if uh, do you are you responding to me, or uh, uh, it's better if uh, Helene just goes ahead first. Um, I was going to respond to Eva. So yeah. if Maria Helene now shakes her head differently, well, okay. So I'll respond to Eva as well. Um, um, yeah. So is it a deliberate choice? Yes, it is. Um, um I think that of course you need to first understand the texts as much as possible within their own um logic. But if we as a field, <laughs> as Jaina studies, want to um make our field um you know clearly significant, etc., we need to go into dialogue with um, other people in Indian studies, but also with others outside of that, um, so that if um, people will refer to <laughs> Indian literature, it would not only involve um, Hindu texts or Buddhist texts. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, and, and if we don't take that lead, who will? So that's that's sort of the the thing I believe in. I also personally feel it makes um, for more interesting research for myself. So, so that's another aspect to that. Um, yeah. Marie Helene, do you want to ask your yeah, question? Only, only, only if there is no other question in the audience. Well, there are to, there are just, some other questions, there, but so just very ahead. briefly, I have a question for Simon because I was really. Um, it was it, it struck me this uh, this episode about this this Emma Gonda who jumped into the fire after mm-hmm. he thought his wife was dead. I thought it was. Uh, I was just wondering whether it was a one of a kind type of episode or whether the vocabulary of this episode did did it like mirror the Sati Kata genre or do do you find other episode like this one elsewhere where it's the husband who the dharma of mm-hmm. a good husband, especially in Jain episode, is 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 this type of dharma? Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, several questions. Which dharma was he following? And was it mirroring mainly sati katas and things like this? Mm-hmm. Or is, is it a genre in itself? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for the interesting question. Um, well, 
not in the Banu of the Chaita, because the Banu was also depicted as building a funeral pyre when they think Beam is dead. So it's not necessarily just, it's more like the response, oh, sadness, so, you know, so we, we like, we, we can't bear to live anymore, so we build a funeral pyre. So, so like, demonstrative, like, to, to demonstrate their, their, their grief, you know, that's sort of the, the idea. But there are some uh, episodes in Jain Mahabharatis um, that sort of, sort of address, like, Sati as a, as a, um, as a thing, like last year at a, yeah, the Cork conference, I did uh, discuss like a certain two episodes that sort of address like um, Jinnah Sena Sarivam Shabudana that also deals with this exile of the Pandavas, like when they're sort of the first exile and how they encountered this uh, young woman who hears that Pandavas have died in, in like in, supposedly died in, in, in Lakshagriya and she was betrothed to Yudhishthira and she decided to, you know, like, uh, like to renounce and um, not become, you know, not, you know. So the point of the story is like Kunti congratulates um, um, this young woman, Vasanthi Sena, I think is her name, for not committing a sati. She, she turns to asceticism instead, like tapas, which is like internal heat. And it's, I mean, I think there's some sort of reference there because the pound of us died in the fire and like there's some play with the, like, the, the fire and the, the, the inherent metaphor of tapas as an internal fire rather than mm-hmm. external fire. Mm-hmm. Like, so that it is there and it's something that like James have addressed and there's this uh, an interesting book by um, Heroic Wise by uh, Whitney Kelting that sort of deals with that. So I think like, James, even in the James Mahabharatas, did sometimes like comment or use that. Like it's 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 that in their mind. They do still think about that sort of um, category, like, you know, mm-hmm. or... Like Sati is something that they must have, you know, been aware of and disapproved of and, you know, sometimes addressed in the stories. But as far as I can tell in Banavichaita, it's, it's a bit all over the place. Like, for instance, like Madri, the wife. So Pandu in the Bhabat of Yasa, Pandu dies because of a curse. Like he is cursed to die as soon as he touches uh, one of his wives, actually. So that's why the Pandavas in the Vyasa are, you know, Side by the gods upon Kunti and Madri. But Pandu gives into the cookers, he uh, tries to uh, approach um, Madri sexually, and he dies. And Madri is the one who follows um, um, uh, Pandu onto the funeral pile. But that's not present in the Pandavichaita or most Jaina Mahabharatists. They all go to the forest and they do diksha. Uh, they do, uh, you know, they, 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 they renounce the world, basically. That's sort of the, the resolution of the, of the uh, yeah, Pandu's thing. Yeah, all right. Um, okay, thanks. And to quickly okay. answer uh, uh, Steve's question, no, there is no reflection um, of the, the name S- back. Simon, yep. could you please read out the question? Because the members oh. of the audience cannot okay. see those questions, oh, or, right, or right, I'll right. read them out. Uh, yeah. But, or Yeah. Um, well, so there's another question by Steve Vos uh, for Simon. Is there any reflection on Baka's name in Deva Prabha Suri's rendering of the story? And it seems that everyone is in disguise in this story. <laughs> All right. Um, so no, there's no reflection on the name of Baka. The Baka it means like heron, right? Like a like a like a like a like a, like a, like a, like a, like a bird. And there is also a f- famous character, the Baka Sura, different Baka. Like I think he's uh, sort of assaulting Krishna, and Krishna kills the, the Baka. But that Baka is a literal heron. No, but like in this story, um, I mean the Pandavas are in disguise, but they're just disguised as, as brahmins like generic brahmins and it's it's not it doesn't really serve as a critique of, of brahmins either in dev prabhasuri's part of the charita either it's i mean it just it leaves out the, the, the discussion of violence system or even to critique it it's completely absent in dev prabhasuri whereas in the Mahabharata, in the back episode it's very much about the violence system it's like a part of the story it's just because you kunti over is this conversation she gradually finds out you know what is going on it's not necessarily they don't immediately say okay Baka is a demanding tribute it's bits and pieces you know as you hear the arguments as to why the father should sacrifice himself why the wife should sacrifice herself why the daughter should sacrifice herself you gradually come to understand you know what what is actually happening like it's Baka demanding you know, like a tribute but it's not about Baka it's just it's this debate, like, you know, what is the, the place of a, like a, each family member in the a family? And that zooms out to the, the violence system as well. So it's, but that's 
absent, done away with, with in, in, the, in the in the basket span of the charity. So it's not it's not even a subversion or a critique. It's no, he wants you know tell a nice story, like introduce tension. Okay, um, then we have a question, and it seems to be, uh, or a comment for a question slash comment from an uh, a person whose name is not mentioned. Um, I think it's mostly for Helene. Uh, most of the Jain sutras, um, is, yeah, Bhagat, Bhagat Puran, I think probably, perhaps Bhagavai is, is intended. Uttara Dhyayana. Anantagar, etc., tell stories only to make a point. They teach lessons, if we say so. How does relating your laughter stories and grotesque images connect with the better understanding of the Jain Dharma? Fully well knowing it is a scholarly presentation and all the preachers talk. Would narratives like this make the Jain Dharma a laughing stock to some? Mm, yeah, so um, that's a question I expected. Of of course. Um, so, okay, my presentation is scholarly. My text is not scholarly. Uh, my text is a Jain text from the 11th century that tells what I've told you, that tells these stories. Um, I've, I've seen another, I mean, later, I mean, and earlier, so Steve and then also Pankaj referred to Bibhatsa. So if you want, you can take these grotesque bodies as Bibhatsa as well. I prefer to see them as absurd. Um, <clears throat> how do they make Jain Dharma uh, lead to a better understanding? Well, in, within the text, it leads to um, refuting the Brahmins. And, and in my, I mean, sort of the um, explanation I try to give is that this sort of laughter, this comical, leads to... Um, the invocation of a, of a world in which we can subvert dominance and power relations and actually open up to this sort of critique um, of the Brahmins. Um, then the text goes on in the Dharma Pariksha by um, telling you in the end, at the end of the text, after, 20, after 18 Parichedas, what the Levratas uh, are. What, uh, what the Shravak Dharma is, uh, according to Amita Gati, and, and in, in, in the normal way, let's say, for the Digambaras. Um, so um, they do not make a laughing stock of the Jain Dharma, uh, absolutely not. Um, I think I try, I, my main purpose of this talk was to point out that it's there um, and that we should not uh, pretend that um, Jain history, heritage uh, is um, without such things. L let me just put it like that, yeah. Okay, um, and then there's a, a question, Helene, that uh, from John Court, I think that kind of connects to, to this issue. Um, he says, you seem troubled that Jane authors would employ humor and laughter as something that contradicts equanimity. Is this a criticism that is internal to the Jain traditions? And um, what, Jain authors what Jain authors have advanced an argument <clears throat> that humor and laughter are problematic and what are the basic features of their criticism? Yeah, um, thank you, John. Uh, that's So that's a complicated question and I don't think I have a, a full answer yet to this question. Um, one thing is that the text, I mean, one important aspect is that the text that I'm dealing with is religious. It is meant to be, to lead to a, to, to, to lead to a religious outcome, namely to take up the, the Jain Vratas, right? The Jain vows. Um, because, and I'm saying this because there are discussions uh, later and that have been discussed by, by Kulkarni and then also more recently, uh, Sasha Restifo. Um, there are aesthetic or literary theory discussions by Jane uh, authors um, that present um, literature as unproblematically um, laukika. So, you know, saying in the 13th century, if I'm not mistaken, that it's fine to have entertainment, right? 
Um, but the question is, of course, how do you combine that then with with a, with a text that is called Dharma Pariksha and that is meant clearly to to be religious? Um, and then I, I looked. I mean, I just looked until now at at the Jain uh, Sutra or the Jain canonical text, let's say, where where Hasya is problematic. Um, and where where this where humor is seen as leading to untruthful speech and truth is a very important topic in these dharma parikshas. So there seems to be a, pro a problematic aspect to it. Um, I do believe that I need to read a bit more um, in other Jain uh, literature to to really get to a, a better point. Actually, um, I mean to publish something like this, right? Okay, but thank you for that. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Um, well, we have one uh, further question, but I think it's probably something, uh, Helene, you have to take away because we are out of time. Um, but uh, Pankaj, thank you for your question. I'll just read it out loud. And I think because it connects to the previous one. Um, and basically, you've already answered, Helene, that you still have to read up on this. So grotesque, Body images are common in Indian mythology, and as an ascetic religion, how the philosophical perspective is served by such a characterization. I think that kind of, I mean, you've already answered this question in your previous, um, uh, in your previous answer. Um, but anyway, um, thank you very much again to uh, to Simon and Helene for your uh, your great lectures. You've given us uh, a lot of food for thought. Um, and I now revert back to Chris um, for some for closing this session. Thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you, Ava, for presiding over the event. That was wonderful. I just wanted to briefly show you all the future agenda page we have on our website here. Uh, I've given you the link. You can just Google dialogues in European Jane studies or you'll get an email about it. But all of our future dialogues are laid out here, uh, including the next one on December 4th. You can register for each of these uh, going forward and you'll receive your Zoom link coming. So the next one will be on collections on December 4th, a very exciting topic about some of the Jing manuscript collections here in Europe, which will be presided by Johannes Belts from Museum for Youth Bag. So we look forward to seeing you all there and we thank you all so much for your kind participation this evening, this morning, wherever you are, and we'll see you next time. Judge and Andrea.